Do you want a party? End of the night! Welcome back to Tied Down TV, the Punk Rockets Opinion Show with me, Danny and Jeff. And today we're talking about our top five punk rock movies. So, when discussing this list, what are we classing as a punk rock movie? Well, for me, I kind of just looked at, obviously, could be obvious soundtrack, characters in it, could be punks, hardcore kids, etc., etc. It could just be the aesthetic of the film, maybe it's DIY, or maybe even just the story in the film feels or like... Or maybe it, just an infl- a later yeah, influence. Yeah, exactly. Various reasons, and, and it's open to interpretation, obviously, like most things are, but these are the ones we, we've picked and, yeah. and, you know... Just got to make it clear, though, we this does not include any documentaries yeah. with strictly... Stick into feature yeah, films. Documentaries yeah. is another time. Yeah. So, so get I'll, us going. I'll kick things off then. For my first pick, 2000, High Fidelity. Now, when we decided we were going to start this channel, we basically quite quickly came upon the top fives from High Fidelity. That's why we group ours into fives, because yeah. we're both fans of the film. It's 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 a great movie. Yeah, well, I said to you, didn't I, when we first started planning the, the, the channel, we said about making a top fives channel you know inspired by high fidelity my plan was high fidelity meets talk sport yeah. that's what my idea was and anyway so the film's you know it's set in a, a record store that he runs rob his name is played by john cusack film he, he gets done by his girlfriend and he and he uh thinks decides he's going to go back over his top five relationships or breakups and um try and work out where he's gone wrong and not all those all those times but in between interspersed, obviously he's, he's running his, his uh, record shop, and it's obviously a couple of a couple of other people who work there with him, and Jack Black being the big yeah. scene stealer in this, obviously with yeah. the uh, Cosby uh, sweater, <laughs> and, and you know various other scenes. He's a funny dude, like, but it's 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 a brilliant film, you know, and loads of punk references in it, really, like you know the Clash get referenced, stiff little fingers, the you know stickers in the mm-hmm. background, isn't it, and, and things, integrity yeah. stuff like that. Definitely, my one of my favourite scenes is the. Um, where he says, I'm going to now sell five copies of the three EPs by the beta band. And he puts that on, the first song off that, the Dry the Rain by the bass band plays, mm-hmm. and it just sets the, like, the mood and the vibe, mm-hmm. and everyone, everyone starts sway like, swaying into yeah. it. And it's, it, it's just cool. And, yeah. and uh, you've got the two like, punkish kids who are, you know, a little bit of an attitude, and they're shoplifting and whatnot, and gets hold of the demo of their band, the Kinky Wizards. And the, the, the song that's played in the shop is actually by a band called Royal Trucks, who are from, I think, I think New York, or based in New York, They're like a noise rock indie experimental thing. Uh, very punk in aesthetic and attitude, that band as well. It's just, it's a great film. One of the one of the best uh, of the 2000s for me. Yeah. Uh, great comedy. I'm a big fan of John Cusack anyway, to be fair. But it's definitely, if you've not seen High Fidelity, you should definitely go and check that out. Yeah, I'll definitely put it in my top five films in the 2000s yeah. for sure. Uh, my first pick, 1985, Return of the Living Dead. Absolute blast of a film. Really fun. Directed by Dan O'Bannon, starring Tom Matthews as Freddy. Uh, people might remember Tom Matthews as uh, Tommy Jarvis in uh, Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives. Also starring uh, Glue Gulger as uh, Bert, the warehouse owner. Yeah. Basically, the story... Um, the bunch of warehouse workers, um, they unwittingly unleash a can of toxic gas, um, which produces a like an acid rain effect on the nearby cemetery where a bunch of punks are hanging out. And as soon as the acid rain regenerates the first skeleton, and you hear, he opens his eyes, he opens his mouth, and you hear, do you want a party? You know you're in for a laugh. Um, yeah, brilliant, brilliant fucking... Filled with just comedy, comedic moments. Definitely doesn't take itself too seriously at all. My favourite ca- character is definitely Bert, the uh, the warehouse owner. What I like about him is he's such a shitbag. Like he, he's obviously like the others. They end up, um, they all end up the punks and the and the and the workers of the warehouse end up trapped in this uh, crematorium. And um, what's so funny about his character is it's his warehouse that the that the stuff has come from. So he's not only trying to survive like the rest of them, but he's also trying to cover the evidence as he goes. And he's, he's such a piece of shit. And there's a really funny bit. You might recognise the famous tar man. Brains. Um, where where uh, the punks have got him. They've got him trapped in it. They've got him trapped in the basement. Yeah. And Bert Gulger's character's got a baseball bat. He's like, open that fucking door. And he opens the door. And as the tar man comes towards him, he just goes, bink, like that. Smacks his head off. His eyes go everywhere. Fucking hilarious. The soundtrack's great. You've got bands like The Dam, The Clash, TSOL, 45 Grave. 
easily the most, uh, the, you know, the easiest watch on my list. Um, and definitely check it out. Return of the Living Dead, 1985. Nice. I've not seen it. I'm going to check it out myself, actually, to be fair. Oh, you're missing out, mate. Yeah. So, uh, my second pick, I've gone with, obvious one, probably one a lot of people thought might get picked in our list for this, uh, Repo Man. From uh, 1984, it was directed by Alex Cox. I think it's Alex Cox's first film, actually, but uh, starring Emilio Estevez, Harry Dean Stanton. It's, it's, so it's an 80s film. Maybe if you watch it for the first time now, you might think it's a bit dated, but I, I still, I, I watched it again. It's I, the datedness of it that makes it so it good. Kind of, it's got a charm, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely that archetypal thing from the 80s and obviously harken back to, it's that rebel without a cause, harken back to the James Dean kind of thing anyway. Yeah. There's a lot of that in a lot of 80s films, isn't there? A young man, mm. rebel, you know, anti-authority, This in this specifically, he's, he's a yeah. punk kid. Um, but he does it well, I think, in the rest of us. And like the first half of the film, it's more about like obviously him and his rejection of, of authority and society and how he mm. lands this job as a repo man, um, which he's kind of conned into really. Yeah. Like second half, maybe or the third after the film, it definitely shifts to more of like a sci-fi tone. And I won't I won't give away the ending and that you know a bit of a spoiler if you do want to watch it. But the soundtrack is fucking killer. It's got fucking. I mean, the the, the theme song is is an Iggy Pop song. I think the intro is just the instrumental version of it. But it's, a, it's an Iggy Pop tune anyway. And there you've got Circle Jerks, Black Flag, Suicidal Tendencies, Fear uh, on there. And the score is pretty good as well. Yeah. It's got one of my favourite scenes of any yeah. film in it in the supermarket where Otto, which is Milo yeah. Estevez's character, is uh, working in a store with his friend Kevin, who I believe is the uh, bassist from Circle yeah, Jerks, yeah. Kevin. And uh, he's singing next to him, feeling seven up. And he says, stop fucking singing. <laughs> the boss comes... <laughs> The boss comes over and he's like, oh no, he starts giving him shit and he just turns to the boss and goes, fuck you. Yeah. Kevin starts laughing, he just grabs him and throws him in the fucking, yeah. throws him into the beans, flips his uh, boss off, flips the bed and uh, leaves his job. And I'm yeah. sure we've all wanted to do that at some point. It's a great film. My favourite scene is, uh, it's only a brief one really, and he, he goes into like a loungy club bit and it's actual circle jerks playing a lounge version of uh, when shit hits the fan. And you know Keith Morris is gonna do this, yeah, yeah. And yeah, he, uh, he looks up at the Emilio Westers and he just goes, "I can't believe I used to like these guys." Yeah. And it it makes me chuckle every time. It warms my heart a little bit because every everyone who's into music and it, it does happen a lot as well in in like punk and alcohol. You know, you know, we're all guilty of gatekeeping and things like that, aren't we? It just kind of reminded me when I was younger and I had a little bit of that attitude towards certain things. But it's it's a good film. It's definitely worth what worth a watch. Repo man. Uh, my next pick is Made in Britain 1982, directed by the great Alan Clark. I've harped on about Alan Clark before. Um, legendary director from my hometown of Wallasey, so a bit of pride there as well. Um, this film stars Tim Roth as uh, a character called Trevor, who plays a skinhead, a very, very, very lost soul, angry young man. Um, written by David Leyland, this was part four in like an anthology of films collectively collectively known as Tales Out of School, yeah. dealing with different parts of like the school system during the Thatcher years. And um, Trevor's, you know, he's a very confused. The film starts off, we see him in a in a court. He's being charged with uh, criminal damage, and then we see him being marched down down the corridor while the brilliant UK eighty two by the exploited is playing. Um, the film goes on, and 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 you know, it, Trev, Trevor's a very frustrated kind of guy. He's trying to, he's trying to, you know, no, it, it's hard to explain, but he's kind of basically a, a character who's kind of, he's kind of fed up with the, he's seen as a number, and he's get, he's he's, he's taking his frustrations out of the fact that he, he, you know, young people are being seen as this number now, and he, he's so angry, and he doesn't want to be part of it, and all this. Um, he's just spiraling out of control as it goes on and on and on, and then. At the end, he finally loses his head. There's a famous scene where he's walking down a tunnel with his top off. Um, things go from, get worse and worse for him. At the end, he ends up in a, a prison cell, gets a beaten by a cop, and you just think, you see for a second the look on Trevor's face, it looks like maybe he's, that's been what he's needed all this time. He's yeah. needed, you know, someone to finally get a hold of him and to be the aggressor towards him. And you think that's it, maybe he's reformed, but just the very last scene of the film freeze frame after he gets a paste in you just see this little evil smile on his face and i think that tells you then that this character is on a one-way trip yeah, to destruction yeah yeah, yeah. Thing, but it's a brilliant piece of work it's by brilliant. alan clark and it's an unbelievable yeah. performance by tim roth i love tim roth yeah great actor like yeah so good film made in britain 982 nice 
So, uh, third pick for me, I've gone uh, 1986, Sid and Nancy, also directed by Alex Cox, who directed Repo Man. Uh, it stars Gary Oldman as, as Sid Vicious. Now, I don't think I've really talked about Pistols much on, on this channel, because neither of us are massive fans. I don't mind them, like, obviously. And I've criticised Sid Vicious, this, the, the persona of Sid Vicious in the past, in conversations about it. But I think this is actually portrayed really well. Now, it's criticised a little bit. John John Lydon, famously, someone asked him what they got right about the film, and he said the names. <laughs> that was it. Um, and if you, I think a few other people involved have said it's not quite true to life. But a lot of the scenes are just Sid and Nancy alone, in, in like when they're in the Chelsea and stuff like that. Because it basically starts, after, you know, Sid has just joined the Pistols. Glenn Matlock's gone. Sid's in. Can't really play. You know, there's a scene where they start playing a stepping stone. And he's like, and he's like, not fucking working. So he just leaves the base and just fucking jumps around with the crowd. But he meets Nancy and obviously she gets blamed a lot for, for Sid being hooked on heroin. But it's also, I've read from other places that like her and the New York Dolls coming over. Because everyone was using speed, not heroin. They came over and obviously they're all in the toilet shooting up speed and everyone and then the New York Dolls turn up, you know, Johnny Thunders and that shooting up heroin and Nancy and then Sid and Nancy come together. Now, Sid was doing drugs anyway, so he possibly would have got hold of that. I don't know. That's beside the point. But it's it's a dark film. It, you know, it shows like this real desperation at times in them, in him, you know, spoiler alert, obviously they both dead. She got stabbed famously. You know, he, he said he had no, you know, no recollection of what happened and things like that, which you could believe because you know they were using heavily uh, a lot, a lot of drugs. And Sid had kind of tried to go solo after the pistols and it hadn't worked. And you know, he cuts. There's the scene of him with his backing band doing, um, oh, what's he called? By Eddie Cochran song. I can't remember the name of it now. And you know, it looks alright and it's quite cool and it's not amazing. But then, like the next time you see him performing, he's to a backing track and he's just in a mess and he's trying to read the lyrics to I want to be a dog by the stooges and it just shows that decline and it, it happened pretty quick and it's it's dark and like I say it's, it's been criticised by a few people I, I actually really like it though I think it's a really good film and I think just as a like kind of it's like a you know a warning and a snapshot of, mm. of drug addiction in the late 70s It's that, but it's worth checking out definitely go and have a look Sid and Nancy it's been a long time since I've seen it I can't remember much I just remember it having a similar kind of feel so Repo Man would yeah. have been an Alex Cox film director, but yeah, it's, you know, there's, there's definitely that there. I mean, yeah. most of the music. I think Joe Strummer had a hand in the score, and and maybe even the Pogues played a few of the tracks. But look, you do the Pistols play, you know, the the, the the actors who were playing the Pistols play some 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 of their songs in it as well. Let's go come check it out. Um, our next is uh, 1983 Suburbia, directed by Penelope, Penelope Spheris, I believe. Yeah. Spheris, I'm yeah, not I sure how you say her name. Yeah. Um, she also direct, uh, directed like the Clan of Western Civilization and all stuff like that. Mm. Uh, the the plot, the, yeah, Wayne's World. The plot um, basically is around a bunch of runaways uh, who collectively call themselves the Rejected, yeah. um, living in a squat off an interstate in Lo Los Angeles. Um, they basically spend their time uh, getting high, going to punk rock shows. Stealing from uh, houses from the richer side of town. Um, one thing I do really like about the camaraderie amongst the group is um, there's a real sense of family amongst them. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, they might not be doing things that people would say are morally right, but they're there for each other through thick and thin. Do you know what I mean? There's there's a few yeah. times fights break out, um, and uh, the the you know they're always there for each other, and it's 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 um. The main, the main guy, I'm not sure of his name, but I've seen him in a lot of stuff. I've seen him in, um, I remember him popping up in um, Point Break yeah. as one of uh, War Child's toughs who, uh, fights, right. yeah, who yeah. fights uh, Keanu Reeves. Yeah. But he's kind of like the bigger brother, the elder brother, I guess. Um, and, it, you know, they're, they're there for each other through thick and thin. And more so, in a, there's a point in it where one of them unfortunately dies and they turn up at their funeral and the family just don't want them there because of the way they look they're just like get the fuck out of here and all mm. this stuff and um members of like the I guess the neighborhood watch hillbilly neighborhood fucking watch can't stand the sight of them and and they warn them to get out of town so many times and all this and then it leads to a quite a dark ending do you know what i mean it's got a few dark scenes there's yeah. a scene at the beginning where a small toddler's decimate ripped apart by a, a, a stray dog and the ending is also quite dark, which sees an, the, another child getting killed. But so, you know, it's quite to the bone at times. But it's a brilliant film, and like I said, the, the probably the highlight scenes are the scenes in the clubs where you're seeing live performance by TSOL, DI, the Vandals, yeah. 
and it really gives you a, a feel of what it was like to be at a show back then in LA. So yeah, that's my next pick is Siberia, 1983. Nice, I haven't seen that for a while. It's been a long time. So very good, very. But good it is film. a good film, yeah. yeah. So uh, pick number four for me. I've gone for 24 Hour Party People from uh, 2002. Now, if you know or you don't know, it's a sort of comedy biopic about Tony Wilson, Factory Records founder. Obviously, you know, not strictly all punk, but, you know, Joy Division, post-punk, and, and even the spirit and the attitude of it was all very DIY, very, very punk for me, but it, it's a fucking great film. It's, it's, I guess it's, I mean, it shows the, um, the, the Manchester, the free, is it the Free Trade Hall, uh, the Sex Pistols show, that like 5,000 people claim they went to, but yeah. only about 20, 30 people were actually there, but yeah. known fact is that most of the Buzzcocks, I think, were there. Joy Division were there, Morrissey was there, I think Mick Hocknell was there. Tony Wilson claims to be there in this film, but I think it's also disputed whether he actually was or wasn't. Mm-hmm. But it's it's a great film, and Steve Coogan absolutely fucking brilliant, isn't he? And yeah. I think we, we, we had the conversation not long ago about it, him based Alan Partridge on the actual Tony Wilson. He's brilliant in everything, Steve Coogan. He really is, yeah. yeah. It, the cameos roll in thick and fast through mm-hmm. as well. as a scene near the beginning when uh, Tony Wilson's girlfriend is getting shagged by yeah, Howard DeVoto from the Buzzcocks in the toilets and then it cuts to the janitor in the toilets and it's the real Howard DeVoto and he kind of looks at the camera and says this, this never happened he famous he was only on the first Buzzcocks 7 inch the Spiral Scratch one and then he, he left and formed the magazine mm-hmm. but you've got Marky Smith shows up in there as well Manny from the Stone Roses um, Tony Wilson himself shows up and I think just in general I say factory but it goes you know from that late 70s tail end of punk post punk right up into the early 90s really the, 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 or the late 80s yeah. Shows you the early beginnings yeah, of the UK the, rave scene. The rave scene, yeah. definitely that Manchester thing as well. Mm-hmm. And Happy Mondays, musically punk or not, definitely I think early on, especially like the attitude, the spirit was all there. It's that's that's you know they were about that. It's just a fucking great film again. One of one of more probably one of my favourite films of the two thousands. I think yeah, one of the more one of the more upbeat again. It's definitely upbeat, ones, yeah. yeah. You know, and and also, like Peter Kay, then it isn't he briefly? Yeah, I don't yeah. want none of that scat. And he's talking yeah. about scat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, go and check it out if you haven't seen it. 24 hour party people, it's fucking yeah, class. Brilliant film. Uh, next pick for me, 1979's Over the Edge, directed by Jonathan Kaplan. Starring Matt Dillon in his very first role. It's set in a planned community in Colorado. Um, it's set in a um, basically a town that's got a, a, a more than average, uh, you know, a more than average, um, what was, what's the word I'm thinking of? Population. Population, thank you. Population of of child of 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 kids basically um, the new normal town explains that at the beginning um, and there's very little to do in this town and um, all they've got is a little place called the wreck that they hang out at um, and basically it's 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 a town basically that as you've seen through a lot of the suits that are in it that it's basically a, a place that's that's quite willing to forget about put youth on the shelf basically yeah. um, as the film goes on there's less and less for them to do they close the wreck down. Um, until it ends up being like literally all them all is left for the kids to do is get high and commit petty crime. There's literally nothing else for them to do. Um, they're constantly being harassed by the jerk off local sheriff guy, which leads to a scene which ends up seeing one of their number being accidentally killed, which pushes the kids quite literally over the edge, yeah. leading to the finale, which leads to a riot in the school, which was actually the big inspiration. Kurt Cobain had for Smells Like Teen Spirit, nice. both for the song and the music video. And you can see it when you watch the end of that film, you can see exactly yeah. the inspiration for that song and that video. Nice. Um, it's a really good, um, it's got a really good, like, kind of clever message, I guess, of what, what, the, what the dangers are of ignoring the voice of youth. Yeah. Um, so it's a really good film, and it's really good to see Matt Dillon in his first film put in such a good performance. Yeah. So, yeah, Over the Edge, 1979. Nice. Yeah. My last pick, I've gone for uh, Green Room from 2015, which is a like a thriller, horror, actiony crossover kind of film. So it, it's about uh, this hardcore band who uh, it starts. They're, they're on the way to to meet up with someone who's supposed to put on a show for him. This local punk kid, um, and he's also got a zine. So he starts interviewing them for the zine, and he's he's asking them some questions, and he asks them, "What's your desert island band? You know, one band you can take with you, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And, you know, they make a few clever quips about, oh, could have picked Sabbath and, I've, you know, Ozzy and Dio, so big. Anyway, but they pick, like, Poison Idea, Crow Mags, Misfits, The Damned, you know, all, all thrown out there. This guy puts on the gig, 
it's shite. It's not in a decent venue. It's you know, it's the like a of fucking the day. It's like a fucking restaurant, restaurant or something. exactly. And they get paid like six dollars. And then he, they, they're, they're like quite angry with him, rightly so, obviously. And they're like, you can't, you fucked us here, mate. And and anyway, he says to him, look, my my cousin, you know, such and such, he can put on a show for you, but it's down in. I can't remember the location. It's but middle of nowhere. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. middle of nowhere. Be warned. It's a lot of boots and braces. And they're like, okay, well, you know, gigs a gig kind of thing. So they rock up at this club. It's full of skinheads. Evidently, white power skinheads as well. Mm-hmm. They load in anyway. You know, it all seems okay. They're just like, yeah, here's the green room. Here's, you know, you're on at this time, etc., etc. You'll make this much money. Cool. And the little Mullen in the green room, the bass player, who's kind of like the de facto leader of the band, says i've got an idea and then you don't see what his idea is until they, they come on they're on stage and they open with and i think actually the bass player starts to bottle it and the guitarist she says to him uh she's like this is your idea she says if you don't play this now i'm going to tell them all you're jewish and they kick into nazi punk's fuck off and it, the tension in the room straight yeah. away you, you get it changes <laughs> yeah. anyway so but they get through the gig they play the gig they get off the stage the guy pays them he's like right we're loading you out now you're done they're on the way out. One of them forgets the phone. Bass player goes, I'll just run back and get it for you. Walks in the green room. Someone's been stabbed. A young girl has been stabbed in the head. And there's a few of the, the sort of like white power crew are in there. And from there, they're, they're trapped and, and it, it goes off. Basically, and... they can't let them go for witnesses, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. That's it. They're stuck. But then it becomes a, a game of, you know, are they going to get out alive? And yeah. there's a few, there's one very gruesome scene a bit with the, the bass player's arm. And getting when he ah oh, that yeah it's grim yeah. and there's a bit where a dog is ripping out someone's throat and stuff. It's quite graphic. It's graphic. Yeah. It's tense. And what I quite liked about it actually because they're trapped in this small building mm. is the film did feel quite claustrophobic. Yeah, like you did feel tense and like you had no. Yeah, it's like a move. siege movie in it. So, yeah, exactly. Films yeah, like yeah, Assault yeah, on yeah, Precinct exactly. Thirteen. Yeah, stuff yeah. like that. It's got a definite feel of that. Yeah, it's good. Patrick Stewart plays the owner of the club. Actually, does a good job. Mm. Uh, it's, it's a good film. It's enjoyable. Like I say, mm. it's 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 actually it's, it's full of gory slash murdery bits and yeah, yeah. good music like I say good reference and, and they harp back a couple of times to this Desert Island bands and when they all realise their life's in danger they'll actually tell you who their Desert Island bands are and none of them except one of them says I'm still picking Misfits but the others have you know I think Sam and Garfunkel Prince and people like that anyway but it's a good film it's the most recent one I've picked Green Room just go and check it out it's worth a watch uh, my, my final pick are we on final pick? yep my final pick is by far the darkest pick I'd say on the whole list yeah his and mine yeah and i've gone for 1980s out of the blue direct mm-hmm. by dennis hopper starring dennis hopper as well as an incredible performance by linda manns yeah people might remember linda manns from um the wanderers play uh she played peewee in the wanderers um like i say this is a this is a really sh- this is a shocking movie mm. uh, we're introduced to the character of cb played by linda manns 13 14 year old girl Tough, rebellious girl who's got an obsession with the Sex Pistols, Elvis Presley. She spends her time, you know, just basically playing hooky, um, just hanging out with her mates. Everything seems, you know, a little, little bit strange, but kind of normal. Yeah. As the film goes on, though, we're kind of exposed to kind of the the trauma she's gone through, um, and things just get slowly and slowly more. What's the word? Depraved. Dark, depressing, yeah, depressed. yeah, yeah. I think all of them are part. Um, and you know, we 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 we, st- we as the film goes on, we we start to see the amount of abuse this girl has took from her parents, from her parents' friends, until we get to the climax again scene where basically uh, all three of them, her, her parents and her parents, the dad, the you know, her best mate's dad, yeah, yeah, yeah. are planning on raping her basically, and uh, she she decides to uh, take matters into her own hands and uh, deal with them accordingly. It's um, like I say, it's a, it's it's a, it's a. Dr- I'd say it's a drama more than anything. It's quite, it's it, you know, like I say, it is quite a sad film. Mm. Linda Manns is absolutely incredible in it. She, she, you know what I mean. She's a, she's an actress who's not really spoke about. I know she had appearances and other stuff. Yeah. But um, like I say, she's great. she's most known for Wanderers mainly, mm. and uh, I think she appeared in like Gummo as well, which is oh, say, kind of, yeah, it's kind of kind of like another punk film, I yeah, guess. Yeah. But yeah. Um, it's it's an incredible piece of work, do you know what I mean? By Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper obviously things like Easy Rider as well. So yeah, but out of the blue, it, it's not going to be for everyone. It's a difficult watch at times, but yeah, that's that from an artistic point of view, that's that's my final pick. It's a great film, that's well, yeah. yeah. So they're our top picks anyway. 
So I'm going to go honourable mentions. I'm going to pick Good Vibrations. I'm going to play, pick Class of 1984. Nice choice. So uh, that, join us next week. We're going to be doing top five. Post-hardcore. Uh, post there you go. <laughs> and uh, thanks for watching anyway. Don't forget to like, subscribe, ring the bell. And uh, jump on the socials if you get a minute. Give us a like, a follow, etc. on your Instagrams and Facebooks. Thanks very much. Yeah!